Now that we have covered the central nervous system and the cranial nerves, we have the tools necessary to learn about the pathways involved in each of the special senses, including vision, hearing, balance, taste, and smell. Our first video on the special senses will cover the sense of vision. Vision allows us to interpret the patterns of light reflecting off of various objects surrounding us in order to make sense of our environment. Our eyes are unique for a sense organ in that they do not just passively absorb information. Instead, the eyes play an active role in controlling what information is available by moving in different directions, focusing on some objects rather than others, and controlling how much light enters. For this reason, we'll need to examine several processes to understand vision. The visual pathway carrying sensory information from the eyes back to the brain, the centers controlling eye movement, and the nerves involved in pupillary size. We'll start with the visual pathway. Vision begins in the eyes. The eyes are a pair of specialized sensory organs whose primary function is to convert light from the environment into neural signals that can travel to the cortex and enter our conscious awareness. Light initially hits the cornea and then travels through the lens, which focuses it onto the retina at the back of the eye. The retina is filled with photoreceptor cells that are responsible for translating light into a neural signal. This information then begins its journey to the brain on the second cranial nerve, also known as the optic nerve. After departing from the eye, the optic nerve travels to the optic chiasm, which is located just under the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Visual information from the medial part of the retina crosses over here, while information from the lateral part of the retina stays on the same side. Following the optic chiasm, visual information continues its journey via the optic tract, which now contains visual information from both eyes corresponding to the opposite field of view, so the left optic tract contains visual information from the patient's right field of view, and vice versa. The optic tract then travels to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus before traveling further via optic radiations to finally reach its destination in the visual cortex of the occipital lobe. And that's it. Once the signal reaches the visual cortex, its journey is complete and the brain is able to convert these signals into the conscious image of sight. To remember this pathway, think about the image of two charismatic travelers looking good naked at the radiant ocean. This should remind you of the optic nerve or cranial nerve 2, the optic chiasm, the optic tract, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, the optic radiations, and finally the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. To help you put all this information together, let's review what happens when damage occurs at various parts of the visual pathway. Because information travels from the retina to the occipital lobe in an organized way, we can predict the effect on eyesight that any given lesion will have based on its precise location in the pathway. Let's say that a person is standing in front of a castle. If they have complete eyesight, they will see roughly this, with each square representing approximately the visual input from a single eye. However, if a lesion occurs in the right optic nerve anterior to the optic chiasm, they would develop monocular blindness and only be able to see this. If damage occurs in the optic chiasm, in contrast, it would result in bitemporal hemianopsia, in which visual information is missing from the lateral fields of view, or those closer to the temples of the head. If, instead, the right optic tract were to become damaged, a left homonymous hemianopsia would result. Damage to the optic radiations would produce quadrantinopsia, in which a specific quadrant of the visual field is missing. Due to various crossings, damage to the superior division of the right optic radiations produces a loss of inferior visual fields, while damage to the inferior division produces a loss of superior visual fields. Finally, damage to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe tends to produce a homonymous hemianopsia, or occasionally a quadrantinopsia. The key defining feature here is that the center of the visual field is preserved, a phenomenon known as macular sparing. Okay, let's do a few blasts from the past, featuring some entries from previous videos that each play a role in vision and eye movement. First, what about the superior colliculi, which we talked about in the video on the brainstem? Didn't we learn that these were involved in the visual pathway? While it's true that some visual signals go to the superior colliculi, it is a branching off of the visual pathway rather than a step along the way. 
That is to say, a few of the signals heading to the visual cortex are instead diverted or siphoned off to the superior colliculi, which can then use these signals to move the eyes accordingly. For example, if you were to see a shadowy figure out of the corner of your eye, your superior colliculi will send signals to the oculomotor, trochlear, and obducens nerves, telling them to move your eyes in that direction. In this way, the superior colliculi play a key role in eye movement in response to visual information. Alright, time for another blast from the past. Some visual signals generated in the retina do not travel in the main visual pathway, but instead go to the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus, where they help to regulate the circadian rhythm in response to environmental light, helping you feel sleepy when light levels are low. Remember from a previous video that you need sleep to be chiasmatic. Okay, time for a third blast from the past. In the last video, we discussed the three cranial nerves that are responsible for extraocular movements. To improve our understanding of these nerves, let's see what happens when each of these nerves becomes dysfunctional. Loss of oculomotor nerve function results in a down and out positioning of the eyes. This is because the two remaining extraocular muscles each exert an unopposed pull on the eyes, with the lateral rectus pulling out and the superior oblique pulling down. Loss of the trochlear nerve leads to paralysis of the superior oblique muscle, which normally helps pull the eye downward at an angle. This leads to an up and in positioning of the eye when asked to look inward. This may cause someone with a trochlear nerve palsy to develop a compensatory head tilt as a way of using their entire head to offset the upward drift of the eye. Finally, loss of the abducens nerve is probably the easiest to understand as its associated muscle, the lateral rectus, performs a simple function, pulling the eye outward towards the ear. For this reason, an abducens nerve palsy results in an eye that drifts inward by default and cannot be pulled outward towards the ears. Tired of blasts from the past yet? I hope not, because there's more. Let's talk about another structure involved in eye movement that has a name that is quite the mouthful, the medial longitudinal fasciculus, or MLF which we first covered in the video on the brainstem. While extraocular movements can be brought under voluntary control, they can also act automatically without our conscious input most of the time. This autopilot function for extraocular movements is coordinated largely by the MLF in the brainstem. The MLS receives motor signals from the frontal cortex as well as information about the position of the head from the inner ear and uses that to generate smooth and coordinated movements of the eyes. Damage to the medial longitudinal fasciculus results in a condition known as internuclear ophthalmoplegia, or INO, in which the eye on the same side as the lesion cannot adduct or look inwards toward the nose. This causes double vision due to the eyes looking in two different directions. Let's watch a quick video to illustrate this. Look at how the patient's eye is twitching when he is asked to look outward. This illustrates what is meant by the word nystagmus. You can remember the association between the medial longitudinal fasciculus, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, and double vision by thinking of the phrase, this MILF I know is seeing double. Okay, to help tie this all together and wrap up the video, let's talk about two different reflexes involving the pupils of the eyes. In addition to controlling movement of the eyes, the body also controls how much light enters them via two pupillary reflexes. The first of these reflexes, the pupillary light reflex, determines how much light enters the eye by changing the size of the pupil. In situations of low light, the pupils will dilate to allow more light in, a process known as medriasis, which is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. In contrast, when there is too much light in the environment, the pupils will constrict to reduce the amount of light entering, a process known as meiosis, which is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. You can remember the difference between medriasis and meiosis because only medriasis has a D in it to allow you to spell dilate. Importantly, light entering even one eye will cause both pupils to constrict. An intact pupillary light reflex relies on both the afferent half, the optic nerves, and the efferent half, the oculomotor nerves, of the reflex to be intact. The reflex arc involves signals from the optic nerve traveling to the midbrain specifically an area known as the pretectal nucleus, which then sends information to the Edinger-Westphal nuclei, also in the midbrain, on both the left and the right. This is why light coming into even one eye will cause both eyes to constrict. 
The edinger westfall nuclei then send parasympathetic signals onto the oculomotor nerve, which then activate the ciliary sphincter in the iris of the eye, causing them to contract and thereby reducing the size of the pupils. You can remember the role that the edinger westfall nuclei play in constricting the pupils by thinking of them as the ew nuclei. When you look at something disgusting, you'll probably say ew and not want to look at it anymore. The ew nuclei then reduce the size of your pupils so that less of that disgusting light is entering your eye. To summarize, let's use a mnemonic to tie together each step of the pupillary light reflex. You can use the phrase, two priests educated three silly pupils to remember this pathway. This stands for cranial nerve two, the pretectal nuclei, the edinger westfall nuclei, cranial nerve three, the ciliary muscle, and finally the pupils. The second pupillary reflex, known as the accommodation reflex, also changes the size of the pupil, but this time the goal is different. Instead of trying to alter the amount of light coming in, this time the pupils are constricting to try and change the shape of the lens so that they can better focus on nearby objects. This process can be tested clinically by placing a finger or other object close to the space between the patient's eyes and observing for pupillary constriction. Watch in this video how the patient's pupils constrict as the object comes closer, then dilate again as the object is moved away. This is a normal process, and if it is defective or absent, this may suggest damage to some or part of the visual pathway. Okay, we've covered a lot in this video. Take some time to review what we've covered, especially how to localize a lesion in the visual pathway based on the specific visual deficits. If you want practice questions, I have some available in my book, Memorable Neurology, which is on Amazon. Otherwise, stay posted for the next lecture, coming soon.